ABC 10, Sean Cunningham, joined by a, good, a guy I've been fortunate to know for a while, a fellow Sacramento native, a guy I got to cover on the Sac our hometown, Sacramento Kings, for a long time. And he really needs no real introduction, aside from the fact that he's really doing big things with Showtime and his own show now, uh, All the Smoke with Steven Jackson. Matt Barnes, thank you so much for coming on during this crazy, odd, unreal, surreal time here in the world. Sean, thanks for having me, man. How are you and your family holding up? We're we're doing good, man. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's strange, um, but I mean, I think I've been through worse, and and having to stay at home isn't so bad. I'm just uh, you know one of the fortunate few that are able to work from do the job from home. Same here. Same here. I, I think about you because I mean, you're in a different situation than me. You got kids and and responsibilities, and I'm yeah, a single no, dude yeah. that has. <laughs> I, I'm I'm similar thinking than you. You know, post career, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do a, have my hands on a lot of different things and businesses and. I was constantly traveling, you know, always traveling to a point where it's just like, man, I feel like I'm still playing. So to be able to sit at home and, and hang out with my kids, like I said, I was a little late getting to this meeting because I had to put my uh, my youngest son down for a nap. But just the time to be able to hang out with my sons and, and relax and be in one place, you know, although it's a fortunate situation that caused this, um, I'm actually enjoying the downtime. That's awesome. That's, that's good. It's definitely good to get some rest. And we also, we miss sports and hopefully this thing ends yeah. soon. But uh, what is it right now that, uh, that, that you find the hardest uh, in managing your day-to-day -day life? Keeping my kids entertained. You know what I mean? Especially right now because it's raining in Southern California. And I have two, I mean, I have three boys, but two 11-year-old boys that are twins that are bouncing off the walls. And normally, um, you know, when it's not raining, we're outside taking runs or working on basketball or football just to try to drain that energy. But with, you know, with it raining, they're stuck in the house. You know what I mean? So it's, it's to keep them from every time I walk away, they want to start wrestling or boxing and really just managing uh, those two have really been, you know, to, that's truly a blessing. You know, that's probably just been my hardest thing. So like I said, I've really been able to enjoy this time. Obviously, pray, praying for everyone who's been affected by this. Um, fortunately enough, I've had nobody close to me that, that has come down with the virus. But, you know, a prayer for everyone who is, Come, come down with the virus and their families, the lives were lost, and really all the frontline workers out there. And I think that's why, uh, you know, our company Vibe has really started this to really kind of pay some respects to these people that are not only sacrificing their lives, but they have families at home too, you know, so they're putting themselves on the front line to save other lives and at the same time, risking their own health and safety of their families. So we really want to show our appreciation to those people. Yeah, speaking of Vibe, I mean, I, I, I've known about Vibe Health Bar for a while now. I know Uriah and, and Josh Emmett and those guys who co-founded it with you. And um, what was kind of the inspiration for you guys in, in start launching this business? And you as a Sacramento native to, to have something like this in your hometown? Yeah, I think it's important to, you know, to have ties to, to, to things in my hometown. You know, I've been working with Brandon Brodsky was a, a friend of my brother's who introduced me to, um, my, my brother introduced me to Brandon and obviously knowing Uriah for a long time. Uh, it just seemed like something I wanted to be involved in, um, you know, post-career and in and, and, and towards later started taking health of my body, obviously more serious. And Vibe was a great way to be a part of something, not only to spread the message to others, but, you know, acclimate in my own everyday uh, use. So, you know, we were able to, to start this company really just behind really realizing that, you know, health is wellness and then health is wealth. And I really think with this new generation, this is kind of more of a, so to speak, Starbucks model of gym. <laughs> You know what I mean? This is a place you can come with your friends, obviously when this COVID is over, but come with your friends, hang out, bring your laptop, you know, get great smoothies, uh, fresh pressed juices. Uh, our, our food is amazing and it's healthy. So really kind of just kind of helping people understand how important health is and trying to make it fun at the same time. That's well said. I know um, you guys have a GoFundMe to help healthcare workers and, and professionals out in the field that are helping. You know, they're really the frontline people with all this. And uh, we'll share some of that information here in just a second. But um, I, I always find it amazing that a little idea can spark and then all of a sudden it just comes to a, a effective, quick plan. Um, how did this kind of thing come about? And, and were you pretty pleased with how quickly things have, have kind of manifested? Uh, you know, the team was talking about wanting to do something to give back. You know, obviously, uh, us being a small business, you know, we've been stifled a little bit by the situation, but we still are able to, you know, want, give back and, and try to help. So, you know, I can't take too much credit for coming up with the idea. Um, they came up with the idea, but, you know, reached out to me uh, before they kind of launched and wanted to have my opinions and, and obviously wanted me to help push and promote, which, which is fine with me. But um, 
I think it's just been a great idea, which has caught fire, and hopefully, you know, through stuff like this and our, us continuing to promote on social media, we can continue to get more money and, and try to help, you know, keep the spirits up and feed more of these frontline um, workers. It's awesome. I mean, just to see kind of the response from Sacramento. I mean, obviously, California has done such a great job in trying to um, uh, follow the rules and get things kind of handled and, and smash this curve, so to speak. But, uh, you know, even seeing yesterday, I'm cruising around Sacramento, um, getting shots and some of the stuff because they all lit up the city in blue and stuff like Memorial Auditorium and City Hall had been lit up in blue in support of, uh, of, of these workers. And it, it's, it's good that, you know, people, it takes people like you guys to kind of bring some of the attention to what these people are doing. You know, these are our un, unsung heroes who, who, who uh, you know, most of the time just go unnoticed, which is unfortunate because they have such a vital role in our communities um, now more than ever. You know, so like I said earlier, these are people that are risking not only their health, but their family's health to save others. You know, so if there's any way we can, you know, make their day a little bit uh, less strenuous or, um, you know, fuel them or, 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 or give them motivation to let them know how much we appreciate them, we'd love to do that. That's awesome. I can't, I obviously we were a month away from your, from your 40th birthday and I, it's, it's right behind you there showing everybody, uh, pretty proud to hit that milestone. I mean, what was that celebration like? It's crazy, you know, to think of, you know, growing up in Sacramento and, and where my path in life has taken me, um, how blessed I've been, how many ups and downs I've had and, and how truly fun it's been, you know, and I, I turned 40 on March 9th. Um, spent it with my kids and my family and, and, and really just happy to be healthy, safe, and um, in good spirits at this time. It was fun, man, to be able to cover you two times with the Kings uh, and also with the Warriors a little bit, being in, in California. As a guy who spent, you played with every team in California, I mean, that's really a, a, a an accomplishment. And one of the things I always loved about it was I came in at a time where you're older than me. And, and, and it was it was tough to not by much, but we're, you know, we're both 1980. So, you know, you, you got there before me. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's been fun, man. And my career was a roller coaster filled with ups and downs, but, you know, I came out and landed on my feet. Um, I just feel like my career was, you know, a, a stepping stone to what I was going to do. Post-career. I made a lot of amazing relationships through the teams I played on and met a lot of important business people that have helped me in, in my next step, which is my post career. And, I'm just as excited about this next 20 as I was about my first, you know, 14 in the league. That's great. I mean, and, and we're seeing what you're doing with it. Um, I, I wonder if even five years ago, you thought that you'd be doing what you're doing right now. I did, you know, Sean, because I think, I mean, you know me well, but I, uh, there's, I think there's such a misconception of who I am as a person, as a man. Um, people get a small glimpse of what I do on the court or catch a slip up on TMZ and think they know who I am, you know? So for me to think that, five years ago that I would be working for ESPN and having my own show on complex and having one of the biggest podcasts in the world. No clue. Never thought it would be possible, but I I think that it's been a blessing because I think there's so many other people similar to me where they've been misjudged or people have preconceived notion on who they think they are. But uh, you know, now that we have the ability of, of social media, and other platforms to kind of show who we really are. I think people are finally starting to get to see another side of me, you know, that they get to see the dad of me and, and, and the philanthropist and the businessman and uh, all the give the, the giving back I try to do. Um, so it's really just the old additive, you know, you can't really judge a book by its cover, you know, because my cover looks crazy, but on the inside, it's a pretty solid book. <laughs> it is one hell of a book, and I can't wait for that to come out. But the good news is, I mean, with this podcast, this show, uh, All the Smoke with, with Stephen Jackson, um, I, there's so many routes I want to take with this show because I find it so interesting, but I just, how did this kind of come about? Um, really very organically. Um, Jack and I were both working for Fox and ESPN at the time and getting a lot of good feedback. You know, people loved our realness and our authenticity. And I kind of feel like we brought that same passion we played on the floor with to obviously whatever we do now. So that it happens to be, um, in the broadcast space and in basketball analyst space. Um, so like I said, we're getting a lot of good feedback. We were sitting, hanging out one time uh, at my place up in the Bay, just talking about, hey, we need to do something. You know, what can we do together? Um, and to be honest with you, I really didn't know much about podcasts and, and still really don't, <laughs> to be honest with you. I haven't even watched all of our shows. Um, but it was something that came along organic. I spoke on DeMarcus Cousins' documentary that he did with Showtime. And one of the producers had hit me up like, hey, I heard you're talking about, about doing a podcast. I'm like, how did you know? <laughs> So I guess the word kind of traveling is like, you know, you should come to Showtime. I was like, oh, Showtime does podcasts. Like, well, they're starting a new basketball 
um, section. We think you'd be a great fit. And we went and took a meeting. They signed us with no sizzle, no nothing, kind of just took a shot in the dark, and it, and it ended up being gold. So it came along very organically, but I just think what that, that's what that show is about. You know, our friendship is very organic. Uh, you can tell how real it is. You know, we, we crack jokes back on one another, and I think through our careers and people kind of get really get to know the people we are, it uh, enables us to go uh, layers deeper with our guests. You know, people are really let their walls down and feel comfortable talking to us because they know that we're not trying to gain anything per se. We're not looking for clickbait. We're not trying to start trouble. We really just want to give people a platform and opportunity to speak on their truths, which often doesn't happen. It's kind of like what I do, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, I can't say enough good things about you, man. You've always been someone who's been solid and been in my family. Like I said, you know who I am. You know, so when a lot of the other BS comes out, um, I know that I can always, you know, you'll sit down and talk and, and, and kind of give my side of the story. So I've always appreciated that about you. No, I appreciate you being willing to share always. I mean, you've always been an open book. Um, with, with this podcast, though, I love how, you know, I, there's been plenty of favorite moments. Um, but I think, obviously, that I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, you know, the cannabis aspect of it. And, you know, here we are in California. It's legal. People use it. And you've been a huge um, proponent of it. And, and, and good for you. I, I think the interesting thing is, do you still run into people who find it taboo? Uh, I think probably here and there, but not nearly as much as it used to be you got to think i've been i've been using cannabis since i was 14 um not something i'm proud of but just to kind of it when i tried it, it it allowed me to escape my reality and and i had a really tough childhood growing up um so it just allowed me to escape my reality it allowed me to relax allowed me to focus allowed me to sleep better so it was something that i used through high school uh, through my ucla career and through my college uh, career and it was always labeled and stereotyped as a drug and something bad for you and a gateway and a problem. If you smoke it, you're a loser and you're this, this and that. Yeah. So it was really refreshing to see, you know, fast forward nearly 25 years now, there's medical research um, on it, backing up everything. I, I knew how it made me feel, but until there was medical research saying, okay, well, it does help you sleep. It does help inflammation. It does help stress. It does help you focus. It's just a blessing to see how far it's come. Although I feel we we're making great progress. We still have a long way to go, but you know, post-career, I've really tried to advocate for not only myself, but guys in the league. You know, I was someone that I wasn't much of a drinker. Uh, I couldn't, my stomach couldn't handle opioids. So when I was hurt, I didn't really have too many choices, you know. So cannabis was something I always turned to, and, and it helped me recover. And if you look at my career, the only time I really missed was being suspended. It wasn't necessarily <laughs> from any injury or anything. And I, I credit a lot of that to, you know, me being able to use cannabis as a medicine. Um, so... I've been very outspoken about it, um, you know, to think that I'm on ESPN on the on the biggest show with Stephen A. Smith having a whole 10, 15 minute conversation about cannabis like I would have never thought that, you know, and I think that now with Major League Baseball and hockey, um, the NFL, all, everyone started to be a little bit more lenient on it. The NBA just said, said they weren't going to test during during these times. So I just think it's. It's, it's a stigma that's being lifted because there's so much education on it now. And I really feel like it's only a matter of time before it's allowed in all professional sports. Um, I think what's kind of the hang up is obviously people didn't have information on before, but also these leagues want to be very um, aware of the message they're sending to the youth. Obviously you don't want to, you know, tell the youth you should do, you know, you should be smoking this and smoking because that's not necessarily what it's for. I think handle responsibly uh, can be very beneficial. So my goal has always been to kind of remove the word high from it and explain the educational and the beneficial sides of it. And I think that's where we're going. Um, like I said, uh, we've come a long way, but I still think we have a little bit way to go, but it's exciting being part of the change. Yeah, I think a lot yeah, of people, a lot of people would want you would want you know want you to say that and 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 communicate that on their behalf. And I I gotta wonder too. I know there's several people who've been on the forefront of this. You're one of them. What's the feedback you hear from other athletes? I mean, I gotta think they come up to you and and, and probably okay. thank you. It's been waves. It's weird. I, I was fortunate enough to be a part of a Bleacher Report 420 um, episode that came out right after I retired, and we were on television. Seven re retired NBA players, seven retired uh, NFL players smoking cannabis but explaining why you know what i mean and that kind of hit the mainstream and from there you know people kind of knew that i did it wasn't something i boasted about but some guys knew that i smoked so like i said i took it upon myself once i retired knowing that the nba can't find me no more suspend me to let me speak on these guys that can't speak or can lose endorsements or get suspended or get in trouble for doing it now so 
ever since I've kind of been the voice along with, you know, there's Al Harrington and, and Ricky Williams. Ricky Williams is almost kind of like the godfather of this. I think he, he was a little bit uh, ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. Research hasn't really caught up to where he was at with it when he, uh, you know, unfortunately almost pretty much lost his career um, over that. So another guy, you know, uh, Sacramento legend, Ontario Smith, shout out Ontario Smith. He lost his career over cannabis. You know, he was on his way to sign a huge deal with Minnesota, got caught up with some cannabis trouble and unfortunately lost a, a very promising career. So the response has been tremendous, not only from NBA guys, but NFL guys, major league baseball guys, you know, with social media now, anyone can get, get a hold of you now. So I've got a lot of just refreshing, sometimes as well as, man, we appreciate what you're doing, bro. And, and it's gone from that to in-depth conversations about how certain players have used it and, and their perspective on it and their voice. So it's amazing to see that there's a voice for us, former players and current players, and that so many players use it. You know yeah. what I mean? That's the crazy yeah. part is I think there was such a stigma as if you're going to be nothing if you use it, but the best players in the world use it. The one percenters use it. And then on top of that, the superstars of these leagues are using it responsibly and managing it the right way and, and still being very productive citizens and athletes. So like I said, I think we've been able to lift the stigma somewhat um, to, due to all the research and education on it. And I hope we continue to move the needle. With the show, you're sitting there with Steven Jackson. Um, you've known him for a while. What's he like to do the show with? Uh, you get tired of him at all? I mean, you guys just seem like a great uh, mix. That's my, that's my guy. You know what I mean? That's like my brother. He was there. Obviously, we met with the We Believe team in Golden State. Um, I lost my mom the following year, and, and Jack was the one guy. Obviously, that the team was very supportive. The Warriors were very supportive. But Jack was the one guy that came to my house every day to try to cheer me up. You know, <laughs> we, we would sit and smoke and reminisce. My mom and his mom were good friends, and he really just – that's when he – went from a good friend and a teammate to a brother. You know what I mean? So ever since then, he's been my guy. Um, and like I said, it, it, it's you can tell through our interactions in the show that it's just, you know, it's genuine. With the show too, do you, ha- do you have a favorite moment? Is there a favorite guest yet? Um, I know that, you, you know, everyone knows, every, it seems like every week you do one of these things and you're making headlines and, you know, you had Kobe's last interview, DeMarcus talks to you and then he gets cut the next day. Uh, just, is there a favorite moment or favorite guest? I would probably say overall, you know, rest in peace to my brother, Cole. You know, for us to have his last interview he ever did um, was special because I got a unique chance to, you know, going from almost fighting him <laughs> to becoming teammates to becoming brothers. You know what I mean? So I always got to see that other side of Kobe. You know, not the Mamba, but Kobe, the man, the father, the business mind. And I just was so fascinated on, on just how intelligent he was and how much he had to offer. And so it was always my goal. I used to even mess with him while we played, like, Cole, why don't you show the world this guy? You know what I mean? And he was just kind of, you know, because he's always been reserved, you know. So for him to kind of start opening up post-career and for us to have such a intimate conversation with him and to, for him to really let his walls down and speak as freely as he spoke, I appreciated it at the time, not knowing it was going to be the last time um, we sat down and talked. But um, it was just really special. But I just think overall – this platform, I've always, like I said, I mentioned in the beginning of the interview, I think there's always been a misconception. I mean, so when I created this show, I really wanted to humanize our guests, show the world that we're just like everyone else, but then also continue to, to dig deep, show who we really are, be able to, you know, dispel any myths or rumors or, or, or BS that's about them and, and give people a comfortable place where they can tell their story. So I think we've done a good job of that. You know, no matter how big or small the name is, I think they've been intimate, deep interviews. And, and my favorite thing about the whole thing is every time we release an interview, I'll, I'll see someone say like, this is my favorite interview. So it could be this release Little Wayne and J.R. Ryder. Uh, these are my favorite interviews. Kobe was someone's favorite interview. DeMarcus was someone's favorite interview. Carrie Champion was someone's favorite interview. Steph was someone's favorite interview. Snoop was, and the list goes on. Uh, Stephen A. Smith, D. Wade, everyone who's come on the show, like you said, we continue to make headlines. And I know that we're doing a good job because, you know, we're seeing our work everywhere. You know, so we're seeing it all over ESPN. We're seeing it on Fox. A lot of people take cuts and edits from what we're interviewing and using them on their platform. So I think that really shows that we're doing a good job. See, I, I'm, I'm someone who, who loves the show and, and realizes that you guys don't need to have a guest in order for this show to be fantastic. And when you do have a guest, I know it brings a lot of people more eyes to it. But um, I'm hoping you guys notice that, too, because the two, the two of you have such a great rapport that you almost don't need it. But is there some guests on the horizon uh, coming up that you can talk about? Or is there anybody that you haven't had that you really want? It, it's been, we've been blessed that we have. We have, um, we have Draymond Green coming up next week. We have Bradley Beal. We have 
uh, Tracy McGrady. We have um, Rip Hamilton, um, Trey Young. We have a handful of people in, in the mix. Um, like you said, I, I think you, you made a good point. I think Jack, myself and Jack's dynamic, you know, we've had success talking just us. But like, like I said, in these times where people are missing sports so much, we want to continue to bring them some of their favorite athletes and, and entertainers to kind of keep their day going and, and take their mind, you know, off this pandemic, if only for, you know, an hour or so. So we have, uh, we have a, a good slew of guests coming. Um, we're also in contract negotiations now to make the show even bigger and, and take it to the next level. So once that happens, I'll be excited to announce the other kind of how we're going to elevate this show. But, you know, we really owe a lot to our fans, and you're a loyal fan. We appreciate that. Like I said, we do it for our fans to really give you guys an in-depth look on who, who who these people are first and foremost and really to just humanize them. Like I said, we, we go through the same, uh, you know, rigors of life and, and death and, and happiness and the roller coaster of life. So just to really kind of show everyone that, hey, we're all in this together. And congratulations for that. I think there's a lot of – I got to imagine there's a lot of people who hit you up and say, hey, I'm ready to be on your show. <laughs> You know, it's cool, it's cool that it's like that now, you know, because at first it was like, okay, shoot, who's going to, who wants to be on our show? Who can we get to be on our show? And luckily, you know, Jack and I both played 14 years for several different teams. So we have a lot of different friends, you know what I mean? And and, and it's, it, the, it, the NBA is a brotherhood. Obviously you're closer to some guys than others, but most of the time it was just a phone call, you know, to KD, to Steph. Uh, we just had John Wall, you know, that these are all people that were in our circles and networks that, you know, we call friends and we call brothers. So we're able to hit them up and, you know, the, the show has taken off so much. Now people are actually hitting us up like, yo, when can I be on the show? You got time for us. And it, it's crazy now because we, we're like, we're backed up. You know what I mean? So I'm still finding people and people hitting me up, but we're still booked out for like the next month. So it's been a tremendous blessing. Like I said, I could have never expected it to be what it is. Um, I hope it continues to grow. I hope we continue to, you know, <clears throat> grow our fan base and, and, and continue to bring people content that they know they can turn to. That's awesome. That's well said too. I, I wanted to switch shift gears just a little bit. Cause I, you made a mention the other day that, that, um, and I completely agree with it and I hope this comes to fruition, but we could be in store for, we could be in store for some of the best playoff basketball that we've, that the world has ever seen because of cor this quarantine and the COVID-19 virus. I mean, you know, it's a silver lining for sure, but, but how, how do you see that happening? Can you see that play out? And I, I know you had mentioned it. I agree with it. And, and I just wonder how deep in the summer that this thing could go. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the only thing now. You know, I think when I spoke on that, that was the day the league got canceled. Um, I was in New York doing first take and get up in these shows. And, and that was when uh, Gobert, they, they had announced Gobert contracted it. And, you know, slowly but surely they had shut everything down. So not really knowing the, the climate or the situation, how long we're going to be on lockdown, I just felt like people don't understand like how long our season is and, and what a marathon it is. And, you know, something like the Warriors, where the Warriors were in their dynasty run, they played more basketball than anyone in a five-year span, you know. See, so, so for us to be able to take like a real break going into the playoffs, <clears throat> I thought would be special because you're going to see a, a well-rested LeBron. You're going to see everyone at their best. But now not really knowing how long it's going to be before we play, hopefully we still will get to finish this season and, and crown someone. I just think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, this is – although it's like riding a bike for us, you can't just throw these players back in the fire and expect it to be good basketball. To me, I really feel like guys are going to need 7 to 10 to 12 games to kind of get their footing back underneath them, get their rhythm, get their chemistry, work through any nagging injuries. And then that's when I feel like playoff basketball be at a, a new high. But it just kind of depends because you got to think the longer it takes for the league to, to, to come back, the longer it's going to take for guys to get back in playing shape because no matter what you do, I know LeBron is posting videos of working his butt off and other guys are doing what they got to do to – stay in shape but you know covering basketball so long there's no way to simulate an NBA game or an NBA practice or the intensity that we play with in, in, in our focus so um, we're trying to find this silver lining uh, I, I hope it, it it starts to shine bright when we can figure out when we can get back when these guys can get back to work though but I, I do feel like if we're able to get back to work um, you know as long as these guys get a little warm-up time a handful of games to warm up that the playoffs are going to be a blast do you, are you almost like, I mean, I know there's two, there's almost two trains of thought, either someone who's 
strapped to cable news all the time and, and watching this thing play out, trying to get all the updates, or do you try to block it out or have a happy medium? I mean, it, it seems really difficult to do, but with two boys, I know it's, it's, it's definitely occupying your time and maybe put it on the back burner a little bit. A little bit, uh, a little bit of both. You know what I mean? Honestly, you get a lot of information from social media. You know, I watch a lot of CNN, um, but it's tough because you'll hear one thing and then there'll be a conflicting report or this is right. And this is not right. You know what I mean? So it's really hard these days with all the conspiracy theories and the 5g and every, everything uh-huh. that going on, man, yeah. it's really deep, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm not someone that believes in conspiracy theories all the time, but you know, you start reading and then you read a little deeper and you're like, well, maybe they have some here, you know? So I try not to get too deep into that. Uh, you know, my thoughts and prayers are just on more and everyone staying safe, uh, understanding social distancing and, and being responsible because you're not only responsible for yourself, but you're responsible for everyone else you come in contact with. So, you know, as you mentioned, I have children, you know what I mean? So I can't put myself in a situation to one, contact the virus, and then two, possibly spread it. Um, so it, it, it's tricky. Um, you know, we're, I, I think as a society, we're doing the best we can. I hope that people continue to realize and take this serious, realizing that the sooner we really take this serious and lock down, that we'll hopefully hit a peak and start coming back down and, and, and get back to life as we some sort you know kind of know it i don't think things i think from here on it's going to be post covid you know i mean so everything from here is kind of kind of sl- a clean slate and obviously no one knows how it's going to be but i really have a feeling that everything is going to be different you know i was talking to someone the other day on how we just take the smallest things for granted you know as, when it comes to germs you know as much as we handshake and hug and kiss someone on the cheek and all the little things we do, like it, now it's going to be like, well, man, do I shake someone's hand? Do I greet from a distance? You know, so it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But, you know, hopefully that we, we can, uh, this can come to a peak and start dropping down and hopefully not lose too many more lives. And we can get back to life as, as, as we somewhat know it. Right on. Final few for you here real quick. I just wanted to ask too, um, because you are a father, have you, have you gotten creative in some of the ways you help pass the time for them? And do you have any advice to share for people out there with kids? <laughs> no, you know, I got a 16 month old and a, and a, and two twins and I'm by myself, you know what I mean? So it's, it's just being, I, I told someone in life and business and in a fatherhood and parenthood right now, creativity wins, you know, so however you can be creative, you know, when it's just me and the twins, We'll go on runs and we'll work out basketball and football. I'm, I'm back playing video games, which I don't like because I used to be really good at playing video games and I stopped. And now my 11-year-old sons are kicking my butt and talking trash on top of it. So when they go to bed, I try to work on my video games a little bit. But just trying to do stuff, you know, arts and crafts. Uh, we turn off the lights and play tag. Like, like I said, to me, I just try to shift my mind into being a kid and what kind of stuff I would like to do. So I try to incorporate that with my boys. Um, and just have fun. Like I said, I'm really appreciating the time. It's unfortunate what caused all this, but you know, my life is hectic with traveling and working all the time that I'm really just enjoying sitting down, being a father, let, let my kids get on my nerves because I miss them getting on my nerves and, and just sitting back and having fun. I was, uh, we saw here in Sacramento deer and Fox shaved, you know, cut off all his hair. Uh, Ooh. some, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it. I'll just send you the picture. Ah, it's nuts. <laughs> I know some guys are also going to be adding tattoos. I mean, for you, I mean, I know, you know, you're, you're a champion of tattoos. I don't think you have any more room. I don't have no more room for tattoos. Uh, you know, like I said, I really haven't done anything outlandish, wild, um, you know, because I'm a little, I'm 40 now, you know what I mean? So I have a little bit more sense to me. But like I said, it, guys are being, I love, what, what I do love about this is I'm seeing not just NBA players, but other athletes talk, talk to each other, but letting the world see it. You know, they're doing Zoom calls where they're recording and putting it on social media or having, you know, back and forth, you know, uh, IG, FaceTime, IG Live, just really giving the fans an in-depth look because that's what they want to know. I mean, they can see our talent on the court all the time, but I think we're at a point in, in, in culture now where they want to know who we are off the court, off the field, off the diamond. So I think this, is, this has been a time where guys have let their guard down. You see LeBron talking more. You see Carmelo talking more. You see all these guys just having D-Wade regular conversations. And I love it because that's how we normally are. We just don't normally show the world that. So the fact that now that these superstars are, are sitting and talking to fans and engaging each other, I think it's, it's, it's been really good. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I know, you know, in following you as an NBA player and covering you, luckily enough to do that twice here in Sacramento, I know sometimes there were good memories, sometimes there were bad memories. How do you look at just the times that you were here in your hometown? I know that brings a lot of pressure with you when you do play in your hometown, but um, is it is do you kind of look back at the final time as a little bit sour still, or has some of that stuff subsided? Well, you know, I got there the first time. Um, I went to the D League after I was being drafted. I uh, got called up by the Clippers. Had a solid, you know, second half year once I got called up and I was supposed to sign, a, you know, a small two-year deal with them. But this was the same time when the Kings were it. And, I, you know, me being a huge King fan and Chris Webber being a big brother, mentor, and friend to me, I'm at home working out with the Kings all the time with him, Jay Will. I'm in the gym working out with Albie and Connie. Shout out Al's old ass. But, um you know, just getting it in and having a good time. So it came to a point where, like, okay, well, I haven't signed a deal with the Clippers yet, but now I got a chance to play with my hometown king. So when that presented itself, I sat down and talked to Rick during the summer, uh, Adelman one time, and him and Petrie decided to give me a chance. And I, it was awesome. Like, no ex- – I mean, I'm, you know – four years removed from school, maybe five years, six years removed from Sacramento. So it's good to be able to come back home and get another house and and have my family and friends there to watch me play. So it was a dream come true. And then, you know, I'm a throw in in the Chris Webber trade and we get sent off to Philly. And that was the worst time ever. (laughs) You know what I mean? Just sitting through the winters and we didn't have a very good team and the coaches, Mm -hmm. both coaches were terrible at the time. So I went from like thinking like life couldn't be any better to man how did I get here you know what I mean so that's kind of how the first situation ended and then to be able to come back um towards the end of my career thinking that hey you know I'm gonna sign a three-year deal here I'm gonna retire I really took pride you know I, I've, I've learned a lot I've had a lot of ups and downs in Sacramento but I really take pride in where I'm from and, and the people there and I love the people um, I have a lot of stuff in the works for the community out there so I'm thinking man this is a great way to retire I'm gonna come home um, I'm going to help, you know, we had a brand new arena. I'm going to try to help get this team in the playoffs for the first time in a long time and just really bring some excitement back to Sacramento. I love to see how downtown has grown. Uh, one of the best fan bases in the world, not in just basketball, but any sport. Uh, Sacramento is very passionate about their teams and I've always loved them for that. So to come back, um, being on the brink of the eighth seed, you know, getting confirmation daily that hey we're not going to trade the markers it was kind of weird because I was somewhat the boogie whisperer so guys the, the GMs the, the owners the coaches will come talk to me on how DeMarcus is feeling and make sure you let them know we're not trading them and so I'm you know kind of in the mix and, and having fun playing and I've always known boogie you know what I mean and I've kind of been like a big brother to him and I'm someone he really listens to so getting a chance to be with him day to day and seeing his talent and and what we kind of were assembling there with coach Yeager I really felt like I just did an interview with one of the, the old Warriors guy, uh, Warriors commentators today, and I really felt that we could have slipped in that eighth seed and maybe won a game against the Warriors, but the fact that just bring the excitement back to Sacramento, being in the playoffs, in that new arena, that's what our goal was. You know, we were hell-bent on we were going to make the playoffs. Coming out of All-Star break, everyone got some rest. We were all excited. And then for DeMarcus to get the call <laughs> during All-Star break that he'd been traded and I felt a certain way, but then taking a step away, I understand it's the business. You know, you always got to do what's best for you, what you feel is best for the team. They got some good young assets for it. But I was to a point in my career at 37 where the Kings were going in a rebuild direction and I didn't have time to rebuild. So Lottie and I discussed it. Um, you know, we came to a mutual agreement. I was, uh, you know, cut free and they ended up signing with the Warriors and winning the championship. But it really was tough for me because, like I said, I, I wanted to go out with bringing some excitement back to Sacramento helping the team get in the playoffs and then kind of just riding off in the sunset, uh, ending my career there. Obviously it didn't happen that way. I won a championship, so there's no complaints, but my, my time there was bittersweet because it was cut short. You know, I, I, I was traded basically the same time, both stints, you know what I mean? Uh, at, uh, right before all-star break with C Webb, and then, uh, during all-star break with Boogie. So I got, you know, half seasons, both times, but my time there was a great, you know, there, there was a lot of mixed, uh, mixed responses. Some people loved me there. Some people hated me there, but that was just what it was. But I personally enjoyed it. Uh, I love being a part of the community. Like I said, I have a lot of stuff in the works, not only by, but doing some stuff in the inner cities, cleaning up, you know, the, the, the inner city makings and working, working with the uh, police chiefs Han out there and, and Steinberg and doing some stuff. So, Heart, Sacramento will always be my heart. I eventually want to come back there one day and, and possibly run for mayor. So um, 
you know, keeping things in perspective, I, I love my time there. I appreciate the fans. I love it there and uh, look to move back there one day and um, have that be my final resting spot. When did that kind of enter your consciousness that you feel like, you know, you, you could run for mayor and, and uh, something see, you'd want to do? Yeah, Kevin Johnson do it. You know what I mean? And, and keeping a close eye on him and talking with him and talking with his cabinet um, of people and them seeing how passionate I was. You know, to me, it wasn't at the beginning, it wasn't so much about the politics of the game. I just loved what he, he did for the for the city. You know, him cleaning up Oak Park and, and being from there, knowing that the areas that really need help and that's what he was trying to do. So, you know, Mayor Steinberg has, has, such, has since, uh, you know, picked up the baton and continue to do it. But, you know, if there's an opportunity for that, that, that raises itself, and I've talked to a lot of the politicians out there, I, I've walked the Capitol floors several days for several different issues. I've helped pass police procedure bills and worked with Shirley Weber on different stuff. So there's a lot of stuff I'm doing behind the scenes that people don't know for the city um, because I love the city so much. And like I said, uh, hopefully one day with, you know, 10 or 15 years down the road, uh, you know, once my business stuff slows down and my kids get a little bit older, um, I can move back to Sacramento and possibly do that. Yeah, it's good to hear about, you know, at least that perspective too with the Sacramento Kings as well. Cause I think there were some, I, I know I'd talked to some people who said, man, Matt, Matt may not ever step foot in Golden One Center again. And I mean, I, to me, it's always been a business. And I think my career through everyone, I know that it's a business. Um, like I said, whether some people like me, don't like me, you can never say that I didn't give my all on the court. And when I played, that's all it was. Now, under, being older and understanding, like, man, why, why, why is this happening again? You'll, you'll beat yourself up thinking about that, man. But I always love the fans. I uh, love the organization. Uh, Kings fan till I die. Um, so there's never no hard feelings with that. That's awesome. I really appreciate you joining me. And again, any of those platform, any of those campaigns, those projects that you're doing locally, you always have a platform here. And uh, I really can't thank you enough for joining us here during this quarantine time. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me, man. Good luck with everything and you and your family. Stay safe. You as well, Matt. Appreciate you so much. Yeah, have a good one.